How's it going, everybody? Brian Alvarez here on Wrestling Observer Live. We are here every day, Monday through Friday, New Pacific 3 Eastern, Sunday, 3 Pacific 6 Eastern, Saturday mornings with Jim Valley, 10 a.m. Pacific 1 Eastern, Sundays with Andrew Zarian, and it is Thursday here on the show, and you know what that means? Well, it means we got big business to talk about. AW Big Business was last night, and shockingly... I don't know if you're aware of this or not. It was the debut of Mercedes Monet. Yes, she is all elite. And she made her debut, and she's going to be on the show next week. Uh, she was in the opening segment and the main event segment. And uh, it's going to be very interesting to see the quarter hours here today, because yesterday I argued vehemently, vehemently, not to put her in the opening segment of the show, because as we have learned from watching The Rock... If you put the big surprise at the beginning of the show, well, when the deal's over, they leave. The uh, segment of the audience leaves. And uh, when you put Rock at the end of the show, you do a gigantic number because people wait till the end of the show. So I thought, well, you should put her at the end of the show. Well, she was at the end of the show, but we will find out via the quarter hours if they made that clear enough in the opening segment. Because if the show does very well and the last segment does well, people got the clue. And if it didn't, they didn't get the clue that she was going to be coming back there at the end. But we got to talk about that. Got to talk about Mark Coleman, who is a hero. He saved his family from a burning house. And for those that heard the show yesterday, he is doing better. So that's good news. Talk about Jackie Crockett passing away. Minneapolis submitting a bid for WrestleMania. NXT numbers. The full AW Dynamite Television report. Stardom, CMLL, and Forbidden Door, and plenty more. If you want to text us, 425-780-7566. That is 425-780-7566. Brian at WrestlingObserver.com, F4W Online at Gmail.com, F4W Online on Threads, Instagram, and Cameo, at Brian Alvarez on X. Got all those? Back in a moment, Observer Live. Welcome to the special tour of Figure Four Weekly Headquarters, as promised. Today I will be accompanied by my assistant Vincenzo, so let's get moving. Hey, don't worry about it. Today's a special day, I'll drive. Today's going to be a good day, so let's not F anything up, okay? Now, I'd like to tell everybody, I just want to give a short speech on the way to uh, the compound here today, and that is that we are going through very tough economic times right now. Right, Vince? It's a time of uh, stock market crashing, the yen is devalued, a time of woe and want. and. Many of you watching this right now, for all I know, are unemployed. But the good thing is, and I always like to look on the bright side, as Vince is well aware, the good news is that for every dark cloud, there is a silver lining. And the silver lining is that Figure Four Weekly is doing great. It's a huge success right now. Subscriptions are up, quality is down, Profit margins are skyrocketing. Things are going very well. So the one thing is that I don't want to make it seem like money is everything because money cannot buy happiness. But what it can buy is enormous houses. And that makes me happy. So we will be going 
to see my enormous house, the Figure Four Weekly Compound. And uh, that's where we're heading right now. Back on the show, Brian Alvarez here, Wrestling Observer Live. Uh, Mike Sembravivi, also of WrestlingObserver.com. We'll talk about uh, Mercedes here in a moment. But first, got to talk about this story. Mark Coleman says he is the happiest man in the world. 59-year-old has been hospitalized since saving his parents from a house fire early Tuesday morning, Fremont, Ohio. Coleman was visiting his parents. By the way, how lucky was that? He was visiting his parents when his dog, Hammer, woke him up around 4 a.m., alerting him to the fire. After getting his elderly parents to safety, Coleman re-entered the burning building to rescue Hammer, who unfortunately did not survive. So his dog, he wasn't even going to be staying there. So apparently there was like a fire in the kitchen. And had he not stayed over, I mean, this would have just likely been a tragedy. But he stayed over. His dog woke him up at 4 a.m., I believe he got his father out of the house. He went back in. He got his mother out of the house. He went back in to get his dog, but uh, he couldn't get the dog. And then he had suffered so much smoke inhalation that he collapsed. And he was covered in soot, soot in his lungs, and uh, airlifted to the hospital, intubated, sedated. And uh, it was... It was. I don't think there was ever a period where they thought he wasn't going to make it. Even the first report I got was that it's really, really bad, but he probably can pull through this. And on Thursday, uh, he woke up. He said, I'm the happiest man in the world. Swear to God, I'm so lucky. Can't believe my parents are alive. Had to make a decision because I got out of my room and went to the door, and it was already horrible. Couldn't breathe. I almost had to go outside, and I went back in and got him. I can't believe it. I got them, but I couldn't find Hammer. So, uh... There's a GoFundMe if you want to check that out. Uh, it's on the front page of WrestlingObserver.com, the link. Probably all over the internet as well. I think they're like $70,000 already, and I think this thing went up this morning. But, uh, yeah, it looks like he's going to be all right. The roof of the home collapsed shortly after they arrived on the scene. And uh, what a hero, dude. Holy smokes. Mark Coleman, one of the toughest guys ever in MMA. And now he saved his family from a burning house. So, what a guy. Unbelievable human being. Unbelievably tough human being. You can't tell the history of mixed martial arts without Mark Coleman. An incredible career and just an incredible story and an incredible tragedy that was spared by that chance that he happened to be staying there. So, unbelievable and all the best to Mark Coleman. So, yes, we did have the debut yesterday of Mercedes Monet. And as I talked about in the opening segment, I'm intrigued by the uh, quarter hours for this show. It's one day. You know, we'll see how things go long term. But the interesting thing is they brought her out at the very beginning of the show. And the question is, she did her whole promo. We'll get to that in a moment. And at the end, she said... I can't wait to tear it up with every single one of you. We'll start with the main event tonight, Riho versus Willow Nightingale. Willow, you and I have a lot of unfinished business, but right now, at Big Business, I'm all elite. And they played her music, and she danced, and she left. And I, I thought, is she coming back or what? Like, they didn't announce it. So the question is, you know, how many fans thought she was coming back at the end? If they thought she was coming back at the end, which she did, I think this show's going to do a very, very good number. If they didn't get the hint that she was coming back at the end, I do expect it to be a very big first quarter and then uh, and then fall back to, to normal levels throughout the rest of the show. So we shall see. But she is Mercedes Monet. Her gimmick is she is the CEO, which Tony is allowing her to be called the CEO. 
You already hate that, don't you? I don't actually. You know what? I don't mind CEO at all. But you know what I do not like? What? I hate this theme. I just. <laughs> God. Do you like it more than the last one? They had what the, was the last cross, one. They had the crisscross sample. That one was that. weird too. But I like. I mean, this one. It's like she's got this new song, which is really funny because when you listen to it, it actually sounds like the beginning of Gunther's theme, and then all of a sudden it breaks into chance of ceo like they put chance in the theme and uh i don't know man i don't know it just seems like it's gonna get grading real quick but uh i mean everything else it was a good debut place went nuts for her came out did a promo talked about her history talked about her dream of becoming the best wrestler the best women's wrestler of all time dropping out of school at 13 chaotic wrestling at 18 and 90 pounds and she wants to make magic here in AEW. And it does appear... Actually, I shouldn't say that, but... Uh, I mean, she's going to do something with, with Willow at some point. She's getting her win back at some point. She was never supposed to lose to Willow for the New Japan women's title. But she got hurt and put her over. And so, presumably at some point, she will she will beat Willow. I don't know if it's if it's imminent. I mean, you could you could have Willow win a title from somebody, and then she ends up beating her at some point down the road. I think her first feud should be like a big name. And uh, you know, at the end of her promo, she 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 didn't quite do it, but she started. She was gonna go C, and then she went E O or whatever. But the crowd chanted along. It was exactly like Britt Baker's DMD. And so I don't know if that was on purpose or not, but uh, I know that Britt was not at the show. She was not in the building. Um, I don't know what they're going to do with her, but that seems like a natural feud. So it looks like probably at some point Britt, probably at some point Willow. But I guess we'll know more next week because she will be in the building. But what did you think of this debut? You know, yesterday I was going to bring up, you could debut her at the beginning of the show, but you're going to have to put, you know, come back to her at a couple of times during the show, which they did not do. Now, it should have probably been enough of a whistle to all the AEW fans that okay instead of the world title match Riho and Willow is closing the show that probably should have been assigned to people that yeah almost said Sasha and Mercedes well, it shouldn't be, it certainly should be a clue it, it should be but what they also probably could have done maybe helped a little bit is also insert her into seeing somebody backstage or having one of those things and I know it's a very WWE thing to do but Probably wouldn't have been the worst idea in the world. Regardless, I'm with you when it comes to the Britt Baker deal. At some point, we're going to have Jamie Hayter come back. It, hopefully, at some point here in 2024, it's got to happen sooner or later. So you have a few that could possibly happen there as well, too. But if it's not going to be Tony Storm, and it does not look like it's going to be the case with Deanna Perrazzo continuing to go after her, to me, Britt Baker coming back, look, Adam Cole's a heel, she comes back upset with the treatment that this person's got walking in and all these other women have got walking in the door, turn her heel. Uh, to me, that's the perfect first feud. Well, you know, I got to say that if you're going to bring back Britt Baker, like, I think she does, she's, she's better as a heel, okay? Absolutely. But, man, I watch this show, and how many heels do we need, brother? Well, we got a lot, a lot, a lot of heels in he AEW. And thankfully, they've at least turned Swerve, and now we've got Will Ospreay, although he's still with a heel group. I mean, they'll have to figure out that story. Well, so technically, so is Swerve, although we saw Toa Leona. No, and... Swerve's definitely turned. Last well, week was Swerve's no, turn. No, but here's the thing. Well, he uh, is Bishop, with a heel group, yes. Bishop, yeah, exactly. And Bishop Khan and Toa Leona kind of came out on their own with their new gear on. So maybe that's a sign that they're going to be distancing them and Brian Cage officially away from Swerve and from Nana, and they should. And it's going to be something they'll need to actually take care of on the ROH broadcast as well as AEW. All right, we'll talk more about uh, that AEW show here in a little while, but a couple of other news notes here and after the break. And again, if you want to text us, what did you think? 425 7566 is the phone number. 425-780-7566. And hey, I want to make sure before the break, I lay down some big time praise of AEW because next week, Dynamite in Toronto, we already have five matches for the show. Thank you. Next week, it's the I Quit match. Christian versus Adam Copeland. 
<laughs> something we'll get to here in a moment. Eddie Kingston versus Okada for the Continental title. Mercedes will be there to do an interview. Deanna Parazzo at a mystery partner versus Tony Storm and Mariah May. And Chris Jericho versus... Five matches already announced for next week. So if you're in Toronto and you're waffling, brother, you know it's going to be on the show. You got no excuse now. Go buy some tickets. Back in a moment, Observer Live. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. How y'all doing? How are you doing? I'm excellent, Brene. I'm excellent. Yep. Uh, very excited that you're able to join us here tonight. Congratulations on retaining the AEW World Championship in such an incredible match with Hangman Adam Page, Swerve Strickland. You guys beat the ever-loving hell out of each other. Should I ask you if you're even remotely surprised that you are still our champion tonight? Not at all. Um, you know, I've always made it a, a point to uh, you know tell the world what I'm going to do, and I think that I've delivered uh, on every uh, promise that I've made here in AEW. Uh, tonight was no different. You know, obviously, Swerve and Hangman, two tremendous young competitors, but they just didn't have enough, and I'm just that much better. So here I am, the champion. All right, guys, the floor is open to you guys. Any uh, questions you guys have for Samoa Joe? It's all you. Take the first one right here, Joe. Thanks for your time, Joe. My name is Jonathan McClarty from flagshipnews.com and militarynews.com. Uh, congratulations on your victory tonight. Appreciate it. Yes, sir. Uh, what, do you, what do you think, you know, with Hangman and Swerve, beefing with each other for so long, do you think that served as a distraction to, to further help you to retain tonight? Well, you know, first off, I want to thank your readers for their service. Secondly, um, you know, it was a huge mistake by both those gentlemen. I mean, obviously, they have very, very bad blood between each other. So, you know, these uh, heated issues can often boil over into other parts of their life, unfortunately. It boiled over tonight, which is the worst place for it to happen. So, I mean, if uh, those gentlemen want to stay uh, eyes locked on each other, they thought that the path to salvation was through uh, each other's blood. Well, unfortunately, it wasn't because uh, I made sure that did not happen tonight. So, that's what I feel. Here we go, Lyric Swinton, SNWA Sports. Uh, Radio. So, you talked earlier a couple of weeks ago about bringing back the ranking system as a way to get the best opponents for the AEW World Championship. Today we saw an amazing match, one that you were a part of and also Will Ospreay and Takeshita. What are your thoughts on the growing strong talent pool in All Elite Wrestling and what it means to be world champion during this time with so much talent. I mean, it's indicative of what AEW has always stood for. You know, we go out, we find the best wrestlers in the world, and we bring them together to find out who is the best wrestler in the world. Currently, that is me. But on my heels are some of the greatest grapplers to ever step foot in a ring. You know, when we have acquisitions, men like Will Ospreay, how can you not be excited about the future of this company? And, uh, you know, once again, we've set up a protocol. Will Osprey is new here. He's a fantastic, dynamic athlete, has had tremendous success everywhere he's been. But until he has that success here, I don't need to worry about him. Hey, you ever heard of a compliment sandwich? <laughs> yeah. Well, I I, uh, I liked a lot of stuff on AEW last night, but there was one thing on that show that my brain is melting. Yeah? It's melting, okay? Lion hook? No. Oh. I'm fine with that. So, Okada debuts last week. He's a heel. Which, by the way, if you want the bun part of this compliment sandwich... Golly, I love this guy as a heel. Yeah, yeah he's, he's the great. best. Great. If, if I had to choose the Young Bucks and Okada's babyface or heels, heels nine days out of the week. And there's only seven days. <laughs> Last I checked. 25 8. Things might have changed with daylight savings time. <laughs> but anyway, so he debuts and, you know, beats down Eddie Kingston and everything. And when the show's over, it's like, all right, 
golly gee, at the pay-per-view, Okada and Eddie Kingston for the Continental Crown. And, and you know, Okada probably should win. Come the Continental, the Continental, whatever they call it. Continental Crown. Sure. So uh, so they do a, a six-man this week. I'm like, golly, man, what a match, you know? All these great guys return to Pac. <laughs> you tell us a man with two young kids saying golly so much. Well, I'm, I, hey, if I, if I gave this rant tonight on the Brian Vinny show, there would be a lot of other words. <laughs> but anyway, they do this match, great match, a lot of fun. And, uh, and Okada hits the Rainmaker on Eddie and pins him. And, of course, my first thought is, okay, this is the exact same thing they did with Brian Danielson. Danielson pinned him in a match, set up a match at the pay-per-view. Whatever. It's, I don't care. I'm not mad about that. But then, then, they announce that it is not Eddie Kingston and Okada for the Continental Crown at the pay-per-view. They announce it is Eddie versus Okada only, only for the Continental belt next Wednesday. <laughs> I was like, Okay, hold on a second. Where'd even begin? First off, first off, why do we need this match next Wednesday when we already have Adam Copeland versus Christian in their big blow-off match for the title in Toronto? Listen, yes, you should, of course, have a full lineup for the show. People may want to see other people. But, brother, that's what you need for next week's show. That's all you need for the show. You have... Not their actual AW names, but it's Edge and Christian for the title, okay? You don't need anything else for next week. But you know what? You got to show the week after. You could do it there, but anyway, whatever. They're doing the match next week. So, now, it's only for the Continental Belt, not the Continental Crown. It's for one of the three belts, okay? Now, there's only... There's only three finishes possible, okay? Finish number one is you do a disqualification or something and no title changes hands, which I don't think anybody's going to be happy with. But it, actually, honestly, if somebody else booked this match and I had to come up with a finish, that's what I'd come up with, okay? Even though it's the worst, I don't want to see, but like that's the best possible finish in this scenario. Your other finish is Eddie Kingston beats Okada in Okada's first singles match. I would not do this. I think that's ridiculous. And then the third possibility is that Okada beats Eddie and wins one of the belts. Which would mean that you did a Continental Classic Tournament. Which was a great tournament. And the whole point of that tournament was to unify these three belts into a Continental Crown. And after going through this great tournament, unifying the titles, and creating a continental crown, three months later, you're going to split it up. Why would you do this? Is that what the tournament was for, Brian? Yes. Really? There was no half Eddie Kingston gold watch royal well Road, of course Japan, it was that but it was to create a continental Brian crown Danielson can't wrestle in next year's g1 so we created a little g1 we can do every year dude that's Look. all that's all backstage reasons as a I fan know. the reason for that tournament was to create a three belt continental crown and after investing in the tournament we're just gonna go split it up three months later look i forgot was... when that happened to the all japan triple crown it was when they unified the him and idea. split him up three months later. Well, I mean, what is Okada going to do walking around? Do you think he's going to be walking around with the NJPW strong title over his shoulder? Not a chance in hell. Why not? Who cares? Who because cares? Because you're talking about from, okay, take the backstage out of it that you're getting paid to do a job, and if they pay you enough, I'd walk around with the strong title too, but we're talking about on TV, this guy just came over, IWGP World Heavyweight Champion, the guy that everybody wanted to be for the last 10 years, and now he's going to revert to being, I mean, why doesn't he just be? Is he, there a he's TV not reverting back to being up? a strong champion. He's becoming a triple crown champion with to three me, unified belts. But Brian, here's the thing. But now, there you know what, Mike? Belts. Now we have another belt. 
No, but because they're splitting it off from the cut. <laughs> How many the, belts do we need? But we have that belt. Here's the thing: the ROH title should not be on TV on AEW TV, and they need a champion. Okay, put it back there. I don't think any strong title should exist at all. But they continue to push them because I guess for touring in the U.S. and the U.K., they want to have those titles. Okay, fine. Let it jettison back to where it was. Do I think you need a continental title? No. Would I like to see that title at some point? Maybe, you know, merge with the international title? I think that would be great. There are absolutely too many titles. I see what you're saying. And they're saying. about to be another one. But We're we about to have it. another one. But, but Eddie Kingston has defended the continental crown anyway. So who cares? If the ROH title and the New Japan Strong title go away from AEW, I don't think that this is an issue. Although it is interesting booking. Well, nothing is an me, issue, but I don't know why they bother doing this tournament if they're just going to just get all the belts you, out. Three we more belts now. That. We Three more belts. That. All right. Well, someone's going to win the Ring of Honor title next, and now we'll have another belt. But that's but they need a Ring of Honor champion on TV, though, don't they? I mean, Bennett and Taven are walking around with the ROH titles, and the six-man tag team titles have been on AEW television for how long? For what reason? I mean, to me, it is. They have a superfluous amount of belts on TV. The ROH titles would be fine in the realm of, of ROH, and that's it. Same thing with the New Japan Strong titles, period. Now, take this Continental crown and merge it with the international title and be done with it. <laughs> so, but then we're going to defend the belts one at a time again afterwards? No. Oh, well. what, the ROH title and the strong title? I guess. Apparently well, those yeah. are going to go to two other people at some point. And then we'll just have uh, eight belts, <laughs> eight singles belts in AEW. I think is what the number would be. Right? Eight? Because we've got being... five now. Let's You're see. being intentionally obtuse. No, here. I'm not. Just We've got a world yes, title, a TNT yes, title, are. an international title, a continental crown. Now we'll have a continental crown and we'll have, we'll have a dual crown, and then we'll have the other continental title. And we have so we have six right now. After Wednesday, we will have six singles belts floating around in in AEW. Six in the universe. Yes, six. So close the universe when it comes to Ring of Honor. I guess with Taven and Bennett, they can go back and forth because I would want them to work with my young teams like the infantry and guys like that. But the reality is we should never see those belts in AEW. And until it comes time for Forbidden Door, we should never see the strong titles. I know, but here's the problem, Mike. What you're arguing is what they should do. What I'm arguing is what they are going it's to also do. also what they should do. But what they're <laughs> going to do. What I'm arguing is what they're going to do. I, we don't need do? five singles, six singles titles as of Wednesday. We do then not. You know, honestly, six. what do we need an FTW title for? What do we need a TNT title for? What do we well, need an international title for? Like, take all of these belts and merge them together. Maybe that could be next year's Continental Classic, and you can call it the quad title. This person is saying what they might do. So what, what, what are you saying they're going to do? Like, they're going to do a draw? Okada's first singles match on TV is just going to be a draw. That's what they're going to do. Okay, whatever. Hey, do we, hey wait. I'll wait till next week. Do we have brackets for the tag team tournament? By the way, well, this is a mystery because, uh, <laughs> well, you know, speaking of things that listen, piss me hold off, on. Here we go. For sure, we're going to get the brackets on Rampage. Okay, but I could have sworn they said they were going to have a bracketology tonight. <laughs> Wouldn't bracketology be giving you the brackets? I would what else are you going to do so. on bracketology than give the brackets? Isn't that it, not tonight? It's kind of ridiculous, though. You know, you want people to, like, fill it out. You want it to become a social media thing, like what happens in, like, the NCAA tournament. That's what this whole thing is about, March Madness, right? Like, usually you give people more than 24 hours from the time the tournament begins to actually, you know, have some fun with this thing and, and see who they think is going to win. Oh, I see. Bracketology is what they're doing on Rampage. They're calling it bracketology. <laughs> So, yes, so we'll they get can the start the thing on collision. Yeah, the, the tournament starts on collision. They announced okay. that last week. We will have the brackets on Rampage tomorrow. Way more news, and we'll get back to AEW. City of Minneapolis submitted its bid for next year's WrestleMania. They want this The thing. Pro Wrestling Torches bid. The, a Keller bid? Yeah. Uh, they reported Wednesday... Submitted its pitch to hold Mania 41 at U.S. Bank Stadium. The Star Tribune said the process was, quote, very competitive. We are hopeful. I hope we get it, said Wendy Blackshaw, the president of Minnesota Sports and Events. It would be amazing, she said. 
Last year, CBS Minneapolis reported the city was among the finalists for this year's or next year's event. It would be the first time WrestleMania would be held in that city. And WWE has yet to confirm details for Mania 41. So uh, Minneapolis, uh, Minneapolis is what it's looking like next year. We shall see. Back in a moment, Observer Live. You know, I was watching a WWF Wrestling Challenge from 1986. Oh, yeah? Yeah, they got a uh, they got a segment called Wrestler Rebuttal mm. on the show. And I would like to do the, uh, the rebuttal here from the AEW mecca that we've got going on here in the, uh, oh, no. the chat. We had, we had a TNA mecca thread on the board where no matter what they did, it was defended. So I want, I want the explanation for this, okay? I'm sure someone's got a great explanation. So this this continental title match next week, okay? They announced it is under continental rules. Okay? Yes. Mike, what are continental rules? Nobody can interfere. Okay. Nobody can interfere. No, sir. Okay. That's what they say. All right. Did I miss the rule where you're allowed to interfere in a normal match? You're not allowed to interfere in a normal match either. Yeah, well, you're supposed but to. But continental add, rules yeah. are there's no outside interference. There's no outside interference allowed in any matches, okay? How is this different? 
Some Lenny, I know you must have an answer. <laughs> how is how is the rule no outside interference? Oh come on! How is that different from no outside interference? How is that different? I know, I know. But Brian, when it comes to the AEW rule book, it is a choose your own adventure, depending on who is refereeing, what match is going on, who is in the ring. I mean, look at last night. This person says, how- hold on, would the title change hands if there's they've never said that. They've never said that. They've just said no outside interference. Now, what bothers you more as a wrestler, a former wrestler, and as a critic of this stuff, does that bother you more than Chris Jericho and Hook being in the ring at the same time and guys getting choked out and Aubrey's checking on the guy being choked out and then the guy leaves the ring and it's like, none of this would be legal. None of this is technically legal that's going on right now. They're guaranteeing no outside interference. Well, why don't you do that for all matches? If you're not allowed to interfere, that's what the referee is for. That's they, why there's DQs. Did they do that for the first match? Because there was no interference during the, the the Wardlow and Samoa Joe match. Did I miss an announcement where they said there would be no outside interference in that match? I don't know. Connell rules don't even allow for seconds. No one is allowed at ringside. Really? Yeah. Is that is that so? They might steal mm. one of the belts. Mm. Anyway. Okay. Let's uh, let's talk about more from this show, because there was a lot of good stuff on this show. I liked it overall, except for those that Continental Classic thing. So uh, we had Samoa Joe and Wardlow. Dave didn't like this match very much. I thought this was a good match. It's all right. Samoa Joe's a total baby face. Wardlow is now starting to do a, more longer matches, which is what he needs to be doing. That's exactly why that match was good <laughs> last night. His finish was so great. Mm-hmm. because Joe always does the choke, but he's like a big dude. Well, Hook always does the red rum, and he's a small dude. So whenever Hook goes for the red rum, he leaps on somebody's back and he applies the hold. Well, Wardlow's a big dude, and so Wardlow goes for a power bomb, but Joe avoids it, and Samoa Joe leaped onto Wardlow's back and put on the choke, and Wardlow went out. That finish was awesome. Beat him clean in the middle of the ring, and uh, and then they had to pull apart with Swerve and Samoa Joe. We have gone from a match where both of these two were going to be heels, where now uh, Swerve has turned babyface, and Joe has never, like, turned, but he's a total babyface. <laughs> he was a total babyface in this match, we now have a babyface, babyface main event for the title coming up at the pay-per-view. Now, even more important than that, because those guys are going to be fine, now what with Wardlow? It's very important if you want this guy to be something, and they do. That's why he went in the length of time that he did with Samoa Joe. You know, was it a perfect match? No, but my God, how how often is he wrestling, let alone in there with somebody at Joe's level? So hopefully they have a good plan for him that doesn't just – consist of standing there next to Adam Cole as he sits in a wheelchair cutting promos. Then we had uh, Samoa Joe, or then we had uh, the Elite interview with uh, Nick Jackson's my favorite character on this show. His his uh, his angry Marvez asks, he says, uh, Okada, you know, why did you affiliate with the Elite? And Nick jumps in and he says, have some respect. Call him by his Full ass name. The Rainmaker, Kazuchika Okada. I died. And then Matt says, we helped this guy. Lows to the lows. We helped each other out. I could give you, he says, 14 million other reasons that he joined us. (laughs) Because Tokyo Sports did an article which claimed that AEW had paid Okada $14 million. (laughs) I love that story. For Dr. Evil reasons. write that story? It's ridiculous. <laughs> Barry Bloom did. <laughs> anyway, he says, uh, so Okada's doing this promo. He goes, we're coming for you, Penta Pock and Eddie. Anyway, he says, which made me laugh. Anyway, ha- say happy birthday to Matthew. It was Matt's birthday yesterday. So Alex says happy birthday, and then Okada says no. Sing it. And Alex has to sing happy birthday. This segment was the greatest. Loved it. 
Then we had Best the work Marvez has done since the old Wrestling Observer site. We had the six <laughs> man we talked about. We had the Will Ospreay promo. God, this guy. You know, I said last night as did Dave, I cannot believe WWE missed on this guy. And everybody had 85 million reasons about how there was no way WWE could give him the schedule, allow it. I'm like, dude, yes, they could, but they didn't. Don't act like. I I love how when we're making certain arguments, you know, some of the arguments, WWE is like this global, you know, phenomenon with unlimited cash and they can do whatever. And then sometimes the argument is, oh, they just couldn't afford that. (laughs) Like, trust me. They could pay him more than AEW if they wanted. They could give him the same schedule if they wanted. And they could allow him to live in England if they wanted. They didn't want to, but they could have. Let's not pretend this is an impossibility. It's ridiculous. And they should feel stupid for not getting him. If I were WWE, I would feel stupid for not getting him. But I'm not WWE. Thus, I don't feel stupid. I think they're okay. I think they're... they're They are fine. But God, this guy is like... Oh, well, you know, he's a great worker, but... Not sure if this guy can cut a promo. Not, oh, who not, said that? Not sure about his charisma. Well, look, his promo... Look, to be honest, you could question his promo ability. because I can't. Like, look, yeah, you can't now, but look at his promos, how they've been for the most part, and guys coming over where you actually have to drop some of the obscenities and things like that. Like, That's the only thing we really didn't know about him. Would he be able to cut a promo translating to the American audience? Certainly doesn't look like there's an issue with that whatsoever. I don't think charisma or physical ability was ever in doubt when it came to Will Ospreay. I don't that maybe I guess it was for them, but certainly didn't seem like for anybody else. If they put the rocket on this guy, he would be the biggest star in this con- this company by miles, miles and miles. His promo was incredible. He's got charisma out the ears. The place goes absolutely haywire for this guy. His work is at another level. It's just like, God, what a dude. What a signing. What a bruv, huh? What a bruv. The bruv. bruv Don't get me started because then I'll be stuck on that one for a long time. What's a better champ, bruv or CEO? Cheeky slag. Don't get me started on that one either. Taking the piss, Brian. Darby Allen and Jay White. Darby is out of his mind. <laughs> yeah. Out of his mind. They had a good match. Darby killed himself. And then Jay White pinned him with a sling blade. And then this was the other thing on the show that was just like, all right. So they go to beat him up, and out comes the rest of the Bang Bang Scissor Gang. And they tell Jay not to do it. And they start to help Darby to the back. And Jay then just takes a chair and beans Mr. Ass. And, like, it's done. <laughs> <laughs> it's like so I sat around <laughs> for months as you guys put together Bang Bang Scissor Gang did nothing absolutely nothing nothing and this was this was the the end of it they just turned on Billy Gunn mm-hmm. and we are right back where we started we just have lost like 4 months of everybody's careers that's what happened here. Well, lost four months, but gained two sets of six-man tag team titles. Wow. Cool. All right. I think we got a better use for Jay White here now that we got Osprey and Okada You don't say. We have I a better use would, than when he was doing absolutely nothing. Now would be the time, folks. Now would be the time. And we had uh, Jericho and Hook beating the Mogul Embassy. And then they did a promo later, which was really weird, okay? Jericho says, you know, you are a future champion, but I need to know what it's like to stand across the ring from you. And so I'm challenging you to a match next week in Canada. They're doing one-on-one next week in Canada. But, like, we're supposed to get the brackets for this tournament Friday. They ain't in it. They have to be in it. Why? Why would they be put together and having tag match wins and then not be in the tag tournament? I'll bet you, I'll bet you, Mike... 50 bucks if you want to take the bet that they're in this tournament. You want to take the bet? I'll take the bet. All right, 50 bucks. All right. All right. Because here's why. I think maybe we see, look, for Hook's sake, Hook should choke out Chris Jericho. You can do some sort of weird thing that led to the finish that allowed Hook to get that choke, but I think 
if you're going to do something, we talked about this with Brian Danielson. That would be a big thing. Jericho not only getting choked out by Hook, getting choked out by Taz's son in Canada. That actually is, it would be really something in a feather in Hook's cap. Plus then, if you're going to keep this goofy FTW title around, again, maybe you can do more with it that way. I, to me, I don't, they are not needed in this tag tournament. I mean, let's be honest. And if they are in the tag tournament, to me, it still screams, unless they're going to win it, that it's going to lead to an angle with somebody or, or with themselves later on. It just doesn't make any sense when you have so many teams. And then we had uh, Kyle O'Reilly promo, which, man, I saw this, and I don't trust this bloke one bit. Not one bit. He's turning heel on Saturday. That's my prediction. And then the main event was Riho and Willow Nightingale. This was the best AW women's match in a while. Had the best heat of any AW women's match in a while. This is awesome chance. I mean, you know the key to this match is? This, this is a mind-blowing revelation here. Riho always gets over. And Willow always gets over. So if you put them together, it gets over. <laughs> yes. So anyway, they had a very good main event. Willow pinned her with the doctor bomb. And then the lights went out. They come back on, and Julia is staring down Willow. But then Sky Blue jumps her. Fans start chanting CEO. And so Mercedes, the music hits. Run down to the ring. Quick brawl. Mercedes hits the her. I don't like her new finish either. Have I mentioned that? Hits her new Not finish <laughs> on uh, Julia, which thankfully this time Julia took it great. They did that. It was it was the Kyrie match at the Tokyo Dome. Oh my god! Oh, that was yeah. That was a disaster. <laughs> but then Willow raised Mercedes' hand, left the ring so Mercedes could dance, show went off the air, and uh, it was a good show. And I hope they keep this momentum going, which they should next Wednesday. Next Wednesday should be easy. Toronto. They've already got like 5,000 tickets out or something. I'd have to look after the break. But uh, hopefully they can keep it up. Back in a moment, Observer Live. Hey there, Joe. Rick Uccino, CagesideSeats.com. Congratulations on a great performance tonight. Just uh, wanted to get your thoughts on uh, your new number one contender uh, in Wardlow and the words he had this week where he said he was coming for your spot. Yeah, uh, and, and much like everybody else in this in this entire roster, I mean, it's no it's no surprise Wardlow finds himself where he is. Obviously, a very domineering individual that has had tremendous success, admittedly even against me. But uh, right now, this is a very different version of myself. This is not one that is distracted by other championship titles. I'm the AEW World Champion, and Wardlow will look, will, will soon learn why that is. Hey, Joe, uh, DJ Danny Ocean, 101.9 KISS FM. Um, you mentioned Will Ospreay. We talked about Wardlow. Uh, is there any of these new up-and-coming guys or you got your eye that you want to get in the ring with yourself that you want to defend your title against? You know, once again, I, I refer back to championship protocol. I mean, they have to earn this spot. I mean, uh, this is not me up here picking out dream matches, trying to be nice about this. No, this is me uh, supporting the integrity of the championship that only the best grapplers in the world will compete for it. So, uh, you know, is, is there a, a laundry list of wrestlers I'd be more than happy to take on in the ring? Yeah, every single one of them. And you look up and down our roster, you tell me one person that isn't a dream match. I know what this company is capable of. I know about the competitors in this company. And I am more than happy to prove each and every one of them that they're second tier and they're just not on my level. Hey, Joe. Uh, Swerve made light of the uh, announcing in a poncho situation. Was there ever a time in your life that you doubted that you would be back here where you are in this position? No, because obviously I was planning and taking the time to recover so that I could be back here at this capacity competing at this level. You know, far too, too many uh, uh, dumber athletes in this industry uh, don't take the time to heal. You know, don't bet on themselves and say, hey, listen, I'm going to step away from, from things a little bit and I'm going to come back um, uh, not 90 percent, not 80 percent, 110 percent. And I took that time, and I came back 110%. Now I'm AEW world champion. So, I mean, th this is just indicative of me understanding what I need to do to get things done. You know, I'm, I'm playing this on a very different level than everybody else. Everybody else out here just hoping they get their shot, hoping they're doing things. I'm planning dynasties. And, I mean, it starts with, it starts with me. And that's not going to change anytime soon. I mean, they're, they're playing chess. They're, they're playing checkers. I'm out here playing chess. I mean, this is, it's a totally different game, man. 
And, uh, you know, that, that, that time, I mean, she, doing commentary and ponchos, I, I'm still a millionaire. You know, I know what he's talking about. You know, so, I mean, he, he may not like that issue, but, hey, that, that guy on the poncho just whipped his ass tonight and is still world champion. So, I mean, you, you tell me. You tell me who's running things around here. Oh, hi! I guess we're back. Hey! Yeah. <laughs> anyway, uh, I don't know for sure the, uh, there's, there's numbers floating around on the chat here as to what, uh, Dynamite did last night, but I haven't got that confirmed, so we shall wait. But I will say that if you're on the chat and you've seen those numbers, that's a pretty good number. Pretty good number. I know some people were expecting it to be some gigantic one million, blah, blah, but, uh... I was I was not expecting that. I think I think that number, if that's the accurate number, I think that'd be good. But we'll have more on that later on today. Just go to WrestlingObserver.com. It'll be on the front page, WrestleNomics, uh, wherever, so you can uh, you can get the update there. And in an hour, I will be back here with uh, with Lance Storm. He watched the show, wants to talk about it, and everything else going on in wrestling. So that's coming up on a special Thursday edition of the show at uh, 2 Pacific, 5 Eastern. And then uh, an hour and a half of uh, AW Dynamite and NXT with uh, Brian and Vinny show tonight. We got a lot to talk about from those two shows. And, uh, yeah. And for the Twitch people, I see that it is scheduled that uh, Brian Rose is going to be doing a little F4W gaming with Final Fantasy VI coming up at 10 p.m. Eastern time tonight. 10 Eastern so. tonight? Check yes, out sir. Brian Rose playing a video game. I like that Brian Rose. He's a fine chap, is what he is. Not a bloke? He's a fine bloke, too, I guess. Right. But anyway, that's coming up tonight and uh, and lots of other stuff to talk about. So we're going to wrap it up for today. Thanks, everybody, for listening. Mike, as always, callers and listeners, everybody in the studio. We'll talk to you next time, Wrestling Observer Live.